The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in 1 John 5, and we're ready to start verses 16 and 17. 1 John 5, verse 16. Once again, this is your opportunity to make sure that you are ready to go spiritually by being under the filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. This is your responsibility before God to, once you get here, to have the right mental attitude with regard to the information to be communicated to you. Because this is doctrine, this is sound truth, this is necessary for the edification of believers. God has seen fit to preserve this information in his word in time for our edification and at this point in our personal history. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that heaven and earth will pass away, but that your word will never pass away and those who do the will of God abide forever. We thank you that we are in that company and that we as believers have had and continue to have the opportunity to hear spiritual information necessary to bring us forward to maturity and to the Mamah seat. Bless this Bible class to that end. In Christ's name, amen. One announcement, uh, as, I, as, we, as we announced, we plan to have a annual spring picnic this coming Sunday following the second session, and there's a sign-up sheet. Obviously, this could have to be pushed back if the weather is not good, and they're projecting rain for the next week off and on, so we'll have to, we'll have to play it by ear. All right, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, if anyone sees, this is a third class condition, you may see or not see, eris subjunctive, uh, vitos to see, uh, his brother, fellow believer, under Adelphos, uh, committing a sin, uh, sinning, uh, present participle, hamartano, uh, actually you have the verb and, and the noun, but it, you can't, it's, Committing a sin will have to do. Uh, <clears throat> sin is in the singular. Particular type of sinning uh, is in view. Uh, not, weak negative may, to death. Preposition pros with the noun thanatos, death. <clears throat> he shall ask. Future active indicative. At some point, he will make a prayer petition, future active indicative, uh, and God is in italics, because it's not in the original, but that's the idea, and he will give him life, zoe, <clears throat> uh, to those, to those who commit a sin, uh, he will give him life, Zoe, uh, a, uh, and not a sin leading to death. Uh, there is a, a, another category. A sin or an activity that leads, that is the path to the uh, sin unto death. There is a sin to death. Leading is in italics. There is a sin, singular, present active indicative, to death, preposition P-R-O-S, pros, to death. I do not say, uh, I do not say, neg strong negative O-U, uh, o uh, concerning this, the pronoun echinos, 
uh, and the present active indicative, I do not say that he should ask, that he should make request, uh, that he should make request. Uh, <laughs> For this is added, but anyway, uh, all unrighteousness is sin. This is like the statement that all sin is lawlessness. It's just another way of viewing it. It's falling short of the uh, perfection of plus R. Uh, so all sin falls in the category. All unrighteousness, <clears throat> adakia, is sin. And there is a sin not to death. Okay. Good luck on this one, Jack. <laughs> no, really. What are we to make of this? How are we to approach this? Uh, because we always see people sinning. Do we not? We see people, we see believers around us getting out of fellowship and uh, we have the presence of mind to realize that they will recognize it and confess their sin and move on. And we don't have to intercede for them. I mean, we don't go around interceding for everybody we see sinning. That's all we'd be doing. It would be overwhelming to have to be involved in doing that sort of thing. So uh, I get, you know, well, the part about uh, there are types of individuals, and I guess you would have to exercise discretion in this. There's individuals you don't want to bother to pray for because of the nature of their uh, activity in sin, and then there are others you can pray for. So this is one of those that's kind of... Uh, different. I don't, I mean, I know we have all kinds of scriptures of praying for believers and uh, in various situations, uh, including, uh, you know, under divine discipline or, uh, you know, out of Bible class uh, and things of that nature. So this isn't an easy one, and I, I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, so I'll, so this is what you're going to get from me on this at this point. Uh, in verse 16, John presents an example of intercessory prayer that we might engage in. Things John has asserted about sin in this letter. A, those who advocate sinless perfection in believers are liars, that you can arrive at a point where you don't sin anymore. And we're right in the middle of an area that has a major denomination that apparently has this doctrine that they have espoused that you can reach or reach this second work of grace where all of a sudden you're not sinning anymore. Well, then they would fall right smack dab into that. And uh, so uh, that they are labeled liars in 1, 8, and 10. Uh, however, whatever angle you get with uh, that, um, uh, and, and, and there are other groups in the history of the church that have ad advocated this utter nonsense that believers reach sinless perfection in time. There is no support for this at all in the Word of God, and in spite of verses like this, they go ahead with it anyway. When believers sin, they are to confess it for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. Very simple. When a believer sins, it is the responsibility of the believer priest, and we do it all the time, acknowledge it before God. So John is here referring to obviously some more of an extreme case and more of an extreme situation. Uh, we are to avoid sinning, obviously, 2-2. Two, two. Christ is our advocate with the Father, 2-2. Two, two. E, he is the propitiation for all the sins of all humanity, 2-2 two, two, and 5-10. Sin is lawlessness, 3, 4. So it's important to understand that any sinning that you and I engage in is an act of lawlessness, and here in this verse, an act of unrighteousness. Okay, we get that. 
Sin means to miss the mark. These are other ways of viewing sin uh, in, in Scripture. Uh, the one who has an unbroken history of STA, uh, unbroken history of STA, uh, uh, of STA activity is not a believer because it, it breaks when you believe. When you believe in Christ, you do the right thing, and for a minute, you're not, you're, you're not being ruled by your sin nature. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Three, six. The one who abides in him, the one, the one who abides in him, no one who abides in him, I'll get it, sins. That's to tell you that you can't, see, that's where you can really get in trouble with this. But, it, but the way you, way you work your way out of this one is you realize that sinning and being in fellowship do not coexist. It's either one or the other. It's black and white. So it isn't relative spirituality. Spirituality, if you're in fellowship right now, it's absolute. If you're out of fellowship, that's absolute. No one who keeps on sinning has seen him or knows him. That refers to, it can only refer to the status quo of a non-believer who is from birth to the end ruled, influenced, is, does not have his STA, their STA isolated. See, this is the big dynamic of the Christian life that so many have, have stumbled or missed. Spirituality is by grace, and it's an absolute. And all this we see in the Bible lends itself, once you get this thing started, get it, start figuring it out, then you understand verses like, redeem the time. Your phase two is the time God gives you from salvation to the end, and you are to redeem that time by being in fellowship. Time logged out of fellowship is not redeemed, period. It's, it's, it's lost opportunity, if you will. Uh, so, uh, that was in chapter, that was in chapter three here. Uh, verse eight, the one who practices sin is of the devil. There is an ongoing type of sinning where the devil sinned from the beginning. All right. Uh, and verse nine. No one who is born of God practices or does sin. Because they've broken, they've broken the pattern. So uh, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That's just hating a fellow believer is a mental attitude sin of murder. Jesus taught this that there's two kinds of murder. There's mental attitude hate and there's overt murder. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, a murderer, people kill people, hate people. So the unbeliever is in a continual state of hate because they will not embrace the gospel. Antagonism, hate, whatever word you choose to use. John uses the strong word murderer based on there is a mental attitude sin of murder. There is obviously the overt sin, but there is the mental attitude sin of antagonism and hate and murder. Very strong language uh, uh, that we have here. Uh, not, not always easy to deal with. I'll admit it. First John has got its, tr its tricky. Sitting and the filling of the Holy Spirit, again, do not coexist. You're not, you're in one or the other, as I've illustrated and told you over and over. 
The overriding purpose, I, of the first advent was to take away sins. Five, three, five A. J, hate is a mental attitude sin that characterizes the unbeliever 24 seven because the unbeliever is at a state of enmity with God. And that enmity is broken only when they turn and believe in Jesus Christ. That simple. So it's another way of looking at the world of unbelievers. They are in antagonism to the plan of salvation. We all were, and there's other scriptures in the Bible that deal with our pre-salvation state of our enmity or antagonism. Whether you can remember yours or not is not important. The fact is that we were at enmity with God. We may, and, and peace was made when we believed. And we broke that chain of STA domination. Yes, we were in ignorance. That doesn't matter. We were still antagonistic to God and his plan. That's the world of unbelievers. They have put, and, and it's another way of expressing negative volition. What is negative volition? It's someone who will not line up with, in this case, the gospel. So they're under this negative volition, and so it's hate or a murderer, a type of a murderer. You don't have to kill someone to be uh, charged with mental attitude murder any more than you have to have sex with someone to commit uh, a mental attitude adultery. It's simply lust. Uh, also in 1 John, fear is a sin and the filling of the Spirit casts it out. 4, 8. 3. John here John makes mentions of two categories of sin believers might commit. He's not here talking in this instance about unbelievers. He's talking about believers. That only thing that would make sense here. <clears throat> the first case is one of serious sinning. I presume that it's serious sinning, and it's not just everyday stuff. It's not just ordinary stuff. Uh, I don't really know of, I mean, we pray for people. We pray for people that are acting up. Uh, but, and, and in that sense, we intercede for them. But it's up there to their volition to make the corrections. So there may be a place for praying for somebody who actually acknowledges that they're way out of line and involved in some kind of STA activity. And we could intercede for them. I mean, it's, it's, it really, it, to be honest with you, it is not something that I, I have, you know, I, I think about running into, seeing in common. Because I've excluded all this other stuff. So uh, praying for believers that are, you know, spiritually uh, falling by the wayside but, but they have to get their act together through the circumstances God imposes on them to wake up and quit doing what they're doing. That's, that's hurting them and neutralizing them spiritually. So what I have here is, you know, something that's serious. I, I can deal with the sin and death a lot easier than I can deal with this one. And all I'm doing is being honest with you. What is it? You see a believer sinning. What kind of sinning would that qualify with? And, and uh, apparently they, they understood the difference here. The first case, uh, the first case is one of serious sinning leading to what I would expect divine discipline. But, but on all divine discipline, God matches the, uh, God matches the discipline up if, if believers are smart enough to figure out that they are indeed under divine discipline. Now, they can be stubborn and just roll on with it. And the whole purpose of divine discipline is to turn us away from some activity and bring us back into line. And we've seen case after case of it in the Bible. So the second is even more serious as it leads to the sin and the death. And John, in this passage, does not even encourage prayer for that. 
So you're going to have to have the discernment in this one if it ever comes to you to engage in this kind of an activity. I looked at this over and over and I'm trying to think, what, what does this involve? I'm the only example that I could think of in the Bible, but God told the person to play, pray for, for, for his friends, uh, and that was Job, because of the way his friends treated him during his ordeal. And it would appear there that uh, because of Job's intercession, that they got to skate free. And if he hadn't of, and it was up to Job, it was up to Job to elect and pray for him or not. But Job had also failed the test, so, so he, he prays for his, his three friends who gave him such a hard time when he was under all this misery. Now there's an example of intercessory prayer. Jesus prayed for Peter in his, in his spiritual fall. He prayed for him that he would not lose faith and you know just take it and let it destroy him spiritually. So anyway, <clears throat> eight, if for instance a believer commits a sin leading to severe, sever, severe divine discipline, we can pray for them provided they themselves repent of their sinning. They've got, to, they've got to, if they're under a lot of DD and they're trying to get their act together and get back, we can pray for them, obviously. But I am sure that even if they didn't get prayed for, they, they, could, they could get back on track with God. I mean, we all, we all from time to time have dealt with various types of divine discipline. We're God's children. We get discipline from time to time when we act up. Uh, uh, if we catch it quick and rebound and acknowledge it, then often we can, we can set, that, set that aside, judge ourselves and judge ourselves quickly. God knows how to administer that. That's, that's his total department. Uh, praying for them, well, you can pray for people. Pray for them all you want. Uh, that you might know that have bailed from doctrine. But if they're on the road to the sin and to death, then it is, what's that? They have risen up against the truth or antagonistic to it. I don't have much heart for that. I can pray for them in general that there's anybody in there just got hooked into it by the pressure of others that they might wake up and come around. But then God, that is God's administration over believers. And it really doesn't depend on my prayer whether they get back on track or not. But we do, we do, we do pray for these people. Uh, an example might be that of a believer who has a health issue due to his sins. In that uh, thing in James, that uh, we have tried to apply, but you have to volunteer for this. We don't go out and look for people on this one. <laughs> But, uh, excuse me, uh, in James chapter 5, the prayer of faith, well, in this one, it's a different one. My brethren, he, this is the way he ends his letter. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death, sin unto death, uh, and will cover a multitude of sins. So that's basically straightforward, uh, where you have the opportunity to snatch a believer from the fire, so to speak, but they gotta be willing to, to listen to you. That, they have to be willing to pay attention. It doesn't depend on you. You just do, if you're put in their periphery, then you can help them with that. <clears throat> Continuing, this would be in connection with reversion recovery. They're recovering from something serious. They got themselves into reversionism. And it could be any kind of reversionism. 
they got themselves into. <clears throat> and some other believer, uh, they counsel with that believer, and that believer is there. To, there's other scriptures on how to handle a believer like that and to not to be too harsh with them, but to be firm with them and to help them to get back on track with their Christian life. I haven't had to do a lot of that personally because it just hasn't come across my radar. Uh, a possible example is that of Job's friends who are told to solicit his prayers or else. That was their discipline as, and, and Job had to pull his horns in because they treat him real bad. They spent all this time trying to accuse him of something. Trying to go fishing. Something you must have done. You must have done something to bring this on. You, we're your friends uh, and we're just here because we love you and we want to help you. But they didn't have a smoking gun. They just were trying fishing for something. This surely wouldn't happen to a righteous man. That was the assumption going in and it threw them all off base. And these weren't dummies spiritually. Job didn't have friends that were, you know, didn't have something really going for him. Anyhow. For this to work, a believer must solicit the prayer and another believer prays for his physical and spiritual recovery and getting back on track. Okay. You become aware of it. You see it. Everybody doesn't have to see it. You see it and you pray for this believer as they're trying to make a comeback. You may never have to pull this card out and play it in your Christian life. You may never. Because it's, it's rare you're going to find people who have gone astray who have decided to come back. In my history, those who came back when they did from an extended period of absenteeism and whatever they were doing, they just came back on their own. They just came back, got in Bible class, and got back on track. Uh, so this one is, I have to admit, this is, I'm, I'm wondering about this. I, see, I have to have a concrete example for things to work for me. You know, something concrete. Okay, here's an example. We saw that we see this believer sinning. And we make requests for them that they get forgiven. Well, well part of the, the, the big equation is they've got to wake up to their STA activity because we can't just, God isn't just going to overrule their volition, make everything, or keep them under something. And, and it depends on our prayer for, for them to come out from under it. That's all I see in it at this point. So if there's something I'm missing, so be it. You know, I'm not being cavalier, I'm just saying. Uh, I'm not saying that a believer who is under the sin and, uh, under DV for serious infraction must do this or God will terminate his phase two with a sin and a death. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that John has presented this. He obviously understood it where I don't. I'm just being flat honest with you. Examples in the, in the Bible, we got all kinds of examples in the Bible, believers who had a close call with the sin and the death. I mean, they came close to the sin and the death. They were under the administration of the sin and the death and pulled their horns in short of dying and going into phase three. We have examples of that in Scripture. These are just the ones I picked out. Isaac. Yeah, Isaac. The great Isaac with his... Esau thing. <clears throat> and uh, he, he, he came to this. You, you, saw, you saw in the narrative of when he finally came to grips with it all, like this all dropped on him all at once. He is trembling. He is shaking because he realized what jeopardy he had put himself in spiritually. The close call. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, all that 
mostly for all of us, it's just, it's fear, uh, sanctified fear of coming up short. But trembling indicates someone who has had a very, very close brush with the sin of the death. So if you haven't had that, you don't know what that is. That, but that's a, that's a close call with it. Moses. And that was something as simple as failing to circumcise, have his uh, child circumcised on the way to Egypt. It, the language is real strong in Exodus. He uses language of accommodation. The, lang the language of accommodation of a hitman. And God's the hitman, and he was coming after Moses. He was coming after him. Moses got figured it out, and he was sick too. He was physically ill. But the only record of, of, of Moses ever being sick, he died in perfect health, it was, it was there on that, on that, on that trip, because he violated this important ritual. And he got him into hot water. Not some of the other stuff he did. That got him into hot water and almost descended to death. He got in trouble twice in his ministry for violating symbolism. That one was the one that got him sick on a sick bed. He realized it, and he got his reluctant wife to circumcise the baby boy, and God called the dogs off. And he went on with his ministry. The other one was when he struck the rock twice. Now that violated symbolism, not getting mad, not getting angry as hell, and out of fellowship with those hardheads. He probably did that more than once. You know? They just pushed his buttons too many times. But this one, he hits the rock twice, and he's told this time not to hit it at all, but to talk to it. He violated biblical symbolism. And it got him denied entering the promised land. But he didn't die the sin and the death. He begged God, and God finally said, forget it. You're, you're not taking the people in. So then in that case, he was simply denied a big phase two blessing. That would have been his otherwise. That cut that out. That did not cut out his standing before God forever. That didn't affect that. So it's interesting, the Christian life... Uh, We could add others. Uh, I didn't throw Samson in. We know his weakness. And he got, he, got, he got sloppy and careless. And it really wasn't because he was sleeping with that woman. It was because he told her the secret of his strength and got his hair cut. That's what got him in trouble. Now, he, he'd messed up before in this department. Of course, this, this was the final thing. The woman was the door. This was his weakness. This was the thing that got him in trouble. But he pulled in his horns. He rebounded. And he used his strength one last time for the biggest slaughter of all of his career. Because that's what he was commissioned to do. To kill Philistines and deliver Israel from the Philistine menace and to make life miserable for them. And he did. He executed that part of it, that under, but he violated his Nazarite vow by revealing the source, uh, the symbol of his strength, which was his long hair. That's the story of Samson. There are others you could find in the Bible that came close to the sin and the death. There's no shame in it if you pull your horns in. Yes, it's better you don't go there. Obviously. <clears throat> a, dra a dramatic... Uh, uh, the sin of death is also reserved for all who repudiate doctrine taught to them or making the necessary application that they need to make, <clears throat> even under duress. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a dramatic example of 
the sin and the death in terms of sheer numbers is the Exodus generation. The Exodus generation was laid low in the wilderness. They died the sin and the death by the tens of thousands on given occasions as they went on their, their itinerary in the, in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians 10, 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, that's a clear example of, of the sin and the death, repudiation of the leadership, repudiation of the doctrine, over and over again, and in spite of every incentive to do the right thing, you couldn't, this generation was, was lost in that sense. And also Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 3, Why do we have the Exodus generation in the Bible? So we don't act like them. So we, we, do not, we do not adopt their habits, their rebellion, their antagonism to authority, to teaching, failing one test after another, just flunking them flat out. With all in their background, yes, you could fail a few tests, and that's bad enough, but now you just keep doing it because they had developed all that scar tissue, that hardness of heart. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the Exodus generation. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, right to the Hebrew Christians, who are were getting themselves into some spiritual trouble, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of, of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they'll not enter into my rest. So they were denied phase two blessing of taking the promised land. They, that was all jerked away from them. They died out in the wilderness from one thing after another. 10,000 here, whoever, there, all of them, not one of them got to enter the land except for the two men who weren't like the rest of their uh, people. That's all clear sin into death. Uh, the sin into death maybe has been misrepresented. I, I'm not, I haven't tried to, but the thing is, the thing is, it basically is for the negative believer who stays negative to the end I don't care if you die in our natural conditions and all the rest of it. A negative believer dies and it, 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 it does not, he does not or she does not have that confidence of finishing their course. And so there, there's this negative side to it. What's different from them than the Exodus generation? Okay, they acted up in certain ways. But people who reject the truth and continue to do it passed and, and, and die, that's the sin and the death. You either have, you either die and glorify God in your dying as a believer who was faithful to the end or not. And if it's not, whether it is a gory death or a, just a regular death, lots of people live to advanced age that are negative. That isn't that by itself doesn't prove you're okay because you live to an advanced age, obviously. David Rockefeller died at 106. Where would you like to bracket him? Yeah, 106 years to figure things out. And he was as evil as they come. A big internationalist, one worlder, all of it. Probably heard the gospel in all those years too. So it isn't, Again, there's believers who have died at an early age, but they glorified God in their death. They didn't, they didn't get the long life thing of Proverbs because God's plan called for that different path for them to die early on. And we have good examples in the scripture of believers who died early on, real early on. The apostle James didn't even get his feet wet hardly, but he made his final stand and he was martyred 
And, and his brother, John, he goes all the way to 96, a 96 or so, uh, the end of the century. So that's all in God's hands. Stephen dying early. Stoned to death for his, for his speech. So the sin unto death is to die negative to the plan, not operating under the plan. Hardening one's heart to what the Spirit says opens the door to the sin unto death. It's a path you do not want to go down. Proof, Hebrews 3.12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Turning away from doctrine. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Certain types of unabated STA activity can lead to the sin and the death. Proverbs 132, obviously, involving yourself in criminal activity. Uh, that would, that would uh, be, be something uh, that has its... And, and, and again, he, the writer of Proverbs is writing to a, uh, talking to a son, a believer, and believers have got caught up in everything imaginable. But uh, I'll just, in this one, uh, that's not this one, it's another one. For the waywardness of the stupid will kill them. Waywardness and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Anyway, uh, 9.6. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. Ten twenty seven. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, this isn't an absolute, is it? The years of the wicked will be shortened. I just gave you the example of David Rockefeller. He had all this wealth, all this power, all this influence, and he lived to be 106. His life wasn't shortened. If anything, it was extended. He's dealing in general terms with, with, with people who, uh, who, live, who live a certain way. Uh, so, anyway, the sin and the death is for all who fail to die honorably so as to inherit the prize. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. In other words, he recognized that he could mess it up at this point in his ministry. Believers can overcome a lot of evil, but repudiation of sound doctrine is not one of them. Constant rejection of doctrine will do you in, especially doctrine you have heard and understood and turn away from it. <clears throat> we are commanded to grow in grace and knowledge and adhere to a certain form of teaching that over time accomplishes the maturity adjustment to God. And uh, that's not what is generally taught in Christendom. They, they, give, they give a lot of people a, lot of, a pass on a lot of things. But thanks be to God that you are slaves, you, that, that though you were slaves of sin. See, Paul's, Paul's a little easier to deal with here. Before you were saved, you were a slave to the sin nature doesn't mean everybody is corrupt and evil and unbelievers are out or some really good people. Really good people. But they're slaves to the flesh. They are slaves to sin. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from the sin nature, that sin and the singular, you became slaves of righteousness. Uh, <clears throat> And so forth. Those who have by their actions the word rejected truth, we are not encouraged to pray for. That's what I get here. They have openly risen up against it. I think I can, I think I can be comfortable with that. Now you've got to figure out if that person is indeed in the, falls into that category. But when they rise up against it, 
It's a, uh, there are, there's scriptures that tell you, you, you can pray for certain people. Uh, God even told Jeremiah, don't pray for the nation anymore. Don't bother to pray for them. It's a waste of time. So we should we we shouldn't take this to extreme because we can't we can't always know everything about people, but if they are really hostile and have walked away from it, then, then as we have so many examples in our history, as in three four John provides another label for sin unrighteousness any action that falls short of the righteousness of God is sin, lawlessness unrighteousness whether known or unknown all sinning is is not a candidate for the sin and the death, just divine discipline. And a lot of the sins we commit, we don't get discipline for. The only discipline we might get is we've missed an opportunity to apply doctrine. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, uh, judging yourself quickly is a big deal. <laughs> it's carrying it down the road and repeating it over and over that you can get yourself hammered. The manner and timing of death is not an issue regarding the sin of the death. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.